start the last chapter of our course, chapter four, which focuses on states of consciousness. I hope this is an easy task, but which one of these four words is consciousness spelled correctly? And on the bottom you'll see psychology. Uh, which one of those are spelled correctly? You might think, what's the big deal? But if you do a whole chapter on a concept, it'd be a reasonable expectation to be able to spell it correctly. And in terms of a course, if you do a whole course on a subject, it might be a reasonable expectation to have you be able to identify that word correctly. And yet sadly, every year I have students on the final exam misspell the word psychology. So hopefully this is a very easy task. And if it's at all difficult, uh, please practice it. Now let's consider a family of drugs called the psychoactive drugs. Not all drugs are psychoactive. These drugs, these chemicals, can enter the brain. To do so, they have to cross a particular structure that we discussed a long time ago in chapter three. Take a moment, see if you can remember what structure they must cross. Hopefully you said the blood-brain barrier. Once they cross the blood-brain's barrier, they can affect how we, hmm, three blanks, what do you think? Hopefully you said think, act, or feel by altering neurotransmitter release. We're going to confine our discussion to the families of stimulant drugs, depressant drugs, hallucinogen or hallucinogenic drugs, and drugs with mixed effects. Currently, drugs are more likely to kill teens and young adults then our car accidents. Car accidents can often be unavoidable, a deer, a, pass of ice, a patch of ice, a drunk driver, but drug use is a much more avoidable issue. Consider your parents. Uh, don't put them in the position of these poor parents. Let's consider the drug class known as the hallucinogens or hallucinogenics, but they're also called the psychedelics. Perhaps you've heard the phrase the psychedelic 60s. Examples would include the cactus of the Midwest, one particular variety. Do you know its name? It would be peyote, LSD, uh, D lysergic acid ethylaminide, and no, you don't need to know that, LSD. What's the fancy term for the variety of mushrooms that produce psychedelic effects? Uh, psilocybin. And the very dangerous PCP. So the cactus, peyote, and the mushroom, psilocybin, are naturally occurring plants that produce an LSD sort of high. Now LSD was synthesized by a drug company. When tested, uh, it didn't do anything medically useful and it was ignored. Down the road, it was tested again and it still didn't do anything medically useful, but apparently the technician got a tiny bit in his skin, which absorbed and he had the first uh, LSD high in history. It was written up and eventually LSD found its way into the recreational and drug culture of the 1960s and early 70s in particular. PCP is, in the member, is also a member of this family, but kind of like the gangster member of the family. It was first developed as a horse tranquilizer and painkiller, and it is very effective in killing pain. Uh, people can jump out of a second floor window, run away on two broken ankles. Uh, they can break handcuffs they can get shot or tased and still keep coming. So it's a very potent painkiller. With this, often the user becomes paranoid and often aggressive. So again, PCP, a highly dangerous drug, not at all similar to the rest of the family in terms of uh, safety. Let's now consider the depressant class of drugs. This name confuses some students. They confuse depressant with depression. People would not take drugs, especially recreationally, to make themselves feel depression. So it's not this form of the word that depressants get its name from. Depressed means to slow down, to inhibit. For example, a tongue depressor. So depressed is slow down, to inhibit. So they slow down the functioning of the central nervous system. 
in this process, they reduce pain. So one might be doing a little self-prescription or one might get a doctor's prescription for their pain-killing properties. They also increase sleepiness, which might be good or bad depending on why you're taking the medication. They also reduce anxiety. So if a drug has these three features, it is a depressant class drug. What would be the most commonly used by far? Alcohol, most definitely. Uh, other examples? Well, let's consider the class of drugs called the barbiturates. Now, I know you want to call them barbiturates, but there is no silent R in the English language. So the barbiturates and a more modern family, similar though, called the benzodiazepines. So in the past, if you went to a doctor complaining with sleep issues or anxiety, he or she would have given you a prescription for the barbiturates or the benzodiazepines. Are you familiar with any of the disadvantages of barbiturates and benzodiazepines? If you're thinking highly addictive, absolutely also pretty easy to overdose on, especially when combined with alcohol. So they're no longer a preferred drug class for either sleep issues or anxiety, unless the anxiety is very short term. Uh, benzodiazepines in particular are not designed to be taken every day for months or years. They're typically just for short term use. So these would be some examples of depressant drugs. Now there's also sub class, a subfamily that's associated with a particular plant. Any ideas? If you're thinking marijuana, no. It would be the poppy plant from which we get the drug, the opiates. But let's consider alcohol before we move on to that other subject. Let's consider alcohol and is it our friend or not? I tried to pick the most attractive pictures I could and match my font. So let's consider it. Before the opioid epidemic, it killed more teens than all other drugs combined. It is involved in one out of every three fatal car crashes. And at this point, I usually ask my students to raise their hand if they've ever been in a car crash, and I promise them no follow-up question. And quite a large number of people do raise their hands. One in three of us will be in an alcohol-related car crash not necessarily as the drunken driver, but maybe the person in the other car just trying to get home from work at Stewart's or the hospital, or maybe the passenger in the car of the drinker. So be very careful. Many of us might rarely get in a car where the driver's been drinking too much if we've been drinking too. Uh, please think twice about this behavior and three times and four times. So I think we can conclude very clearly that alcohol is uh, not our friend. I'm sure we're all aware of the opioid epidemic, the effects it's had on our communities, our nation, and some of us personally. Depending on the age group we're speaking about, it accounts from anywhere between 50 to as high as 70% of drug-related deaths. What opioid accounts for the preponderance, the bulk of these deaths? You're saying heroin? Uh, no, fentanyl. And fentanyl is often in products in which it is not expected. So the person might be buying what they think is heroin and it might have also fentanyl. Uh, it might be a totally different drug. And again, it's been uh, enhanced, if we want to use that phrase, with fentanyl. You might be saying to yourself, this will not be me. Maybe you don't use recreational drugs or maybe you use some recreational drugs but would never use an opioid. Uh, you can't necessarily say never me. Half of all people addicted to heroin started with prescription drugs. They had maybe a surgery, an injury, what have you, and they got a prescription for an opioid. And they took the prescription as directed and they became addicted. And afterwards, when they could no longer get the prescription, they turned to street medications. Doctors are often, even at this point in time, often woefully undereducated in the use of opioids it's quite possible that if you do come to a, your physician with opioid withdrawal symptoms in the pre-COVID times, you would have been diagnosed with having the flu typically. So again, uh, if you're taking an opioid drug, this could be you. So be very careful, use opioid medications as little as possible and dispose of them properly. Sometimes it's a sibling or a friend that gets into one's opioid medications and that's how their addiction begins. So again, tread with caution here. 
for your sake and for those around you. Let's next consider the stimulant family of drugs. Common features, well, they don't depress the nervous system like the depressants, they speed it up. They increase alertness, which is why the person might be using them. And they do decrease appetite, which in the past was why people would often use them. Most commonly used, uh, if you're seeing cocaine, you're hanging with the wrong crowd, it would be caffeine. How about others? Well, amphetamines slash methamphetamines slash crystal meth, uh, absolutely. For another example, let's consider a plant that gives us a family of stimulant drugs. If you're thinking marijuana, no, keep thinking. Ah, if you're thinking the coca plant, you are correct. Don't get confused with coca with cocoa. Um, cuckoo for cocoa puffs, C-O-C-O-A. Coca, uh, C-O-C-A. So the coca plant of South America, from coca, uh, you can, the people of South America will often make candies, uh, will often make a very foul tea. Uh, it's just a little bit stronger than caffeine products. Definitely no stronger than uh, Jolt or any of those uh, particular beverages. But other people want more enhanced effects, so it might be uh, refined into cocaine. And for further revision, for further modification, what can be made from cocaine? Indeed, uh, crack co cocaine. Uh, look at the picture at the bottom of the page. An old Coca-Cola campaign. Which brings us to two questions. Did Coca-Cola really have cocaine in it? Uh, yes, it did. Imagine the outcry when they changed that formula. Also, look at the Santa Claus, or I'm sorry, the Saint Nick on the right, compared to our Christmas version of Saint Nick. The red coat, the rounded belly, the rosy cheeks, that specifically came from a Coca-Cola ad campaign. So the modern day Santa Claus was really a Coca-Cola creation. Let's consider caffeine medicinally. Now, certainly is possible with any thing that's good for you to abuse it and overuse it. But in reasonable quantities, caffeine decreases risk of diabetes, decreases risk of Parkinson's, decreases risk of stroke, certain cancers, dementia, and my favorite one, increases morality. People are the most moral in terms of laboratory experiments when they're the most caffeinated. So if you're gonna do business with somebody and you want them at their most honest, uh, do your business in the morning when they tend to be the highest caffeinated. Also decreases prostate issues. Can it be the new wonder drug? Well, quite possibly, but again, anything can be used and abused. So moderation and all things good. Let's look at our last category, drugs with mixed effects. Back when I took intro psych, Marijuana was listed as the most commonly used psychedelic drug. Ecstasy wasn't even seen yet, and nicotine was listed as a stimulant. Now we recognize that these drugs do have mixed properties, and so typically put them in categories of their own for that reason. Let's turn our focus to marijuana. It has certainly many names. Take a moment and see how many you can list, and also see if you know the active ingredient. I kind of suspect that you do. Marijuana has many names, including Mary Jane, Devil's Lettuce, Pot. Uh, during my times of youth, it was referred to as dope. Uh, now I understand it's usually reserved for opiates. Uh, hashish, uh, ganja, if I have mentioned it. So many nicknames. But all different varieties have the same basic active ingredient, and that would be, indeed, THC, Delta 9, hydrocannabinol, but THC is fine for us. Today's pot has much, much, much more THC than the pot of the psychedelic 60s. Let's continue. The next slide will look at legalization. Should we legalize marijuana recreationally, say in New York State? 
As you can see from the picture on the right, 11 states have legal recreational marijuana use. And New York, I think, is on the precipice. Uh, Governor Cuomo is definitely uh, pro-legalization. So should we? Uh, take a moment and list as many pro reasons as you can and con reasons as you can. You should be able to think of items to support either argument. So do take a moment and give it a try. Let's take a look at these pro and con uh, reasons. I'm sure you were able to come up with a few that were on this list. My favorite reasons for the pro side would be tax revenue. Consider the small town of Bennington was able to gather $2 million more in tax money from their marijuana legalization. Imagine what we can do with this money, especially in times like these. Maybe perhaps uh, use it for opioid addiction. Jobs. Uh, there'll be far more jobs now if it's legal, from advertising to uh, physical stores. So it's a job booster. Safety. If you buy marijuana on the streets, you're buying it from a criminal. And who knows what's been put in there? Maybe a little PCP, a little fentanyl perhaps. If it was a government-regulated uh, product, it would have safety. Medical uses, it would be far easier to get access them for medical uses. Better research, a lot of the research done in the U.S. is abysmal quality. The marijuana was delivered to different subjects by different means at different concentrations. Uh, it's not possible to do good quality research if one can't get one's hands on the drug for direct use. So we'll get much better research in terms of what marijuana can do and what it can't. I actually find the research I read very disappointing in terms of, for example, pain control. Uh, people that use marijuana are actually use higher amounts of opioids as compared to people not using marijuana, surprisingly. It surprised me. Let's name and show the countries. Look at the cartel in Mexico, a dangerous place to live to, for a Mexican or a non-Mexican. A lot of that is our fault because we are buying the drugs. Less money spent on controlling whether it's policing, uh, the judicial system, incarceration, and less organized crime. But we should definitely get some con reasons as well. Side of ill effects, it is a drug. People will be acting under the influence of the drug. So societal ill effects, there will be more addictions, and the health issues that go with marijuana use. And there are many health issues, not limited to lung damage, immune system compromise, uh, which is particularly problem right now, uh, decreased fertility levels. I hate when TV uh, government commercials are correct, but it does decrease motivation. Let's consider ecstasy, also called Molly or E uh, or X. Even one use can kill, and of course it does not have to be the first use, it could be the first use, the 10th, the 23rd. One never knows. Why do people die? It tends to cause uh, changes in body temperature and also uh, causes extreme thirst. Uh, some people respond by drinking too much water, uh, affecting their electrolytes and causing heart failure. One use can cause brain damage. Experimental evidence with animals shows that for every use of ecstasy, the neurons in the animal's brain didn't continue to die for a day or two, but for about two months after each serotonin use. It particularly targets the serotonin neurons, making us feel better, but serotonin is very involved in mood. And so if you kill the serotonin neurons, at least a good number of them, you'll make mood depression, uh, mood conditions like major depression more likely, and these particular chemically caused depressions will be much harder to treat than traditional depressions, which can be hard enough to treat. Let's now consider nicotine. Now, nicotine is typically delivered via tobacco. So if one is smoking a tobacco product or chewing a tobacco product, you're not just getting the nicotine, you're getting over 7,000 different chemicals, and that's a huge part of the problem. Nicotine can be toxic. Occasionally you'll see it as a murder uh, weapon in uh, TV crime dramas, but it's very hard to overdose on nicotine from smoking. Now, children getting their hands on vaping products, that can easily be fatal. So again, it's not the nicotine so much as the bad company nicotine keeps. 
Now, vaping th should theoretically be safer, but as we've known, the recent wave of vaping-related lung injury and even death would say at this particular point, the products who vaping should not be considered to be safe. It might surprise you to learn that for every cigarette that's smoked, it will shorten that person's life on average by 11 minutes. So if you have a smoker in your life, this might be a statistic you might want to share. If you are a smoker, this might be a statistic you want to think about. And right now, smoking is even more dangerous because smokers are much more likely to have severe lung damage or fatalities with the coronavirus. If we want to focus not on cigarettes, uh, the toll associated with each individual cigarette, collectively, smokers live 10 years less. That's an immense time difference. So we're done with our psychoactive drug topic and moving on to another topic, uh, also which can be dangerous, multitasking specifically while driving. New drivers are much more likely to be in accidents, and that is no small reason why young drivers have a much higher rate of insurance. But a teen driver with passengers, even when attempting to be attentive, is five times more likely to be in an accident. Again, multitasking, sharing your driving with the conversations and what's going on around you in your vehicle. So beware as a driver, be wary as a passenger. You've probably all heard the using cell phones like taking your eyes off the road for the length of a football field. Well, where do they come up with this? Well, if you use 4.6 seconds as a length of the text, if the person's going at 55 miles an hour, that would be like taking one's eyes off the road for the length of a football field. So if you wouldn't uh, do that when you're not texting, uh, don't do that when you are texting. This picture is a, from a fatal accident caused by the driver texting. Imagine this degree of destruction in that person's life and their friends and family, and also avoidable. Currently, one out of every four car accidents is caused by texting while driving. I did have one student admit that she was texting and caused an accident in which a pregnant woman was involved. Luckily, the baby checked out fine, but still, what would we like to be the reason why a baby died? or somebody else in the car died, or was severely injured or paralyzed. Again, uh, it can wait. Whatever you're doing, uh, it can wait. You might say, well, I use a hand-free device, and that's definitely far better than texting, but it's also far from safe. There's quite an abundant uh, amount of research out there. They'll have the person, our experimental group, with a uh, device in their head, which takes pictures of what they're looking at with their eyes if they're looking at the road versus downwards. When you have the person next to you in the car seat, your eye is spent uh, on the road, as it should be. If the person is in a different location and not with you physically, the driver spends much more time glancing down at the dashboard. Uh, this is to reduce distraction so they can pay attention to what they're listening to. Obviously, they don't know they're doing this, but the eyes are off the road much, much more. So if you think you're safe when you're driving hands-free, uh, know you are not attentive to the road. You are unconsciously being attentive to the conversation. So if somebody's in their car and they're going hands-free, decline to talk to them. Tell them to call you back when they get where they're going. You might actually save their life. So hopefully you've attempted to answer each question before listening to these answers. The ones you get wrong, study until you go to the next part of the lecture, uh, part B. EEG stands for electro 
encephalo, like encephalitis, but electroencephalograph for gram. Sleep stage is in correct order. One, two, three, four. Then three, two, one, or not. And then REM, then repeat. So one, two, three, four, three, two, one, or not, REM, and so on. So by early morning, uh, stages three and four will get minimal or disappear. Discovery of Gnosis, who mesmerized audience, was Mesmer. The most commonly used psychoactive drug would be caffeine. Stimulant drug, also caffeine. Depressant drug, alcohol. In this chapter, we looked at the states of consciousness, spelled C-O-N-S-C, I-O-U, like maybe you hand somebody an I-O-U, then S. For the drugs, heroin is a depressant, caffeine a stimulant, PCP a psychedelic, Valium a depressant, benzodiazepine a depressant, methamphetamine a stimulant, pot mixed effects drug, alcohol depressant, cocaine stimulant, crack cocaine stimulant, opioid a depressant, LSD stimulant, ecstasy, mixed effect drug, and lastly, uh, nicotine, mixed effect drug. And if you're trouble, which probably you would have, I would have by a student, I'll re repeat and try again.